Hello everyone, this is Threat Hunting in Active Directory Environment. Thanks for tuning in to our session. My name is Anurag and today with my colleague Thiru, I'll be talking about Active Directory Security. We both work at Mandiant and at Mandiant, we work on a large number of incident response cases for both small as well as large organizations. Some of these cases involve financially motivated threat actors and others nation state backed. In our experience, through all these investigations and attacks, one thing remains consistent. Majority of these attacks involve Microsoft Active Directory in one way or the other. While working through all these cases, we realized that a lot of defenders do not understand the intricacies of an Active Directory environment, how complex and large the attack surface is. Today, we would like to share some of the attack techniques we have seen threat actors use to target Active Directory. We'll put out some hypotheses based on those techniques. And then we'll talk about how defenders can detect those and hunt for those TTPs in their environment. The bottom line is that we want defenders to understand the AD attack surface better and hunt for attacker techniques in their environment. As I said, my name is Anurag and I am a principal consultant with Mandiant STS based in Singapore. I, in Mandiant, I focus on incident response, incident remediation, Active Directory, and cloud security. I'm also a SANS community instructor for the APJ region. With me, I have my colleague, Thiru. Hi, my name is Thirumalai Natarajan. I'm a principal consultant in Mandiant, supporting customers to respond to major security breaches and assessing their security posture of Active Directory and cloud environments. Along with that, I also have experience in building and managing security operation centers. Apart from that, I am a hardcore football fan. I used to play football, now kind of retired and happily watching in television. In today's talk, we have a lot of hunting context to discuss around techniques and tactics observed in Active Directory environment. I'm going to take a pause for a while and I'm going to turn it back to my colleague Anurag and he will continue the talk. Thanks, Siru, for that. So why talk about Active Directory? Active Directory is widely adopted and is the underlying IT fabric for a large number of organizations. This makes Active Directory a very attractive, lucrative target for the threat actors. Moreover, Active Directory is a large, intricate and complex attack surface. There are a lot of moving parts in an Active Directory environment. This provides several opportunities for threat actors to maintain covert persistence and exert control over a large part of the IT environment. The bottom line is that threat actors are actively abusing Active Directory. It's time defenders step up and start looking for attacker TTPs in their AD environment. The way we have structured this talk is talk through hypothesis. We want to share attacker techniques techniques which threat actors use to target Active Directory. The purpose of doing that is twofold. We would like to provide some sample hypothesis for defenders to hunt through their environment looking for those TTPs. Second, we work with a lot of organizations to execute what we call eradication or eviction events. These events are designed to evict a threat actor out of the organization's IT environment and regain the control of the IT environment. These hunts are based on certain aspects which we see teams, defense teams and eradication teams often miss before they perform the eradication events. So these can be used by the eradication teams to review the environments before doing the eviction event. We have identified some hypotheses. Hypotheses are a hunter's idea of what threats might exist in their environment and that decides what they should be looking for. The hunts we are talking about today, the techniques we are referring to today are actual threat actor TTPs. These are techniques that have been used by adversaries in organizations. I'll talk through the first three hypotheses. I'll start talking through delegation misuse for persistence. Then I'll talk about how attackers can abuse DS replication permission. And then one of my favorite technique, which is persistence using machine dollar credentials. Then I'll hand it over to Thiru, who will talk through malicious group policy objects. GPOs. We have seen 
Financially motivated threat actors extensively abuse GPOs during the last year. Then we'll talk about cross forest trust abuse using seed history. And the last hypothesis we have is how attackers can perform credential harvesting by targeting Azure AD Connect servers in a hybrid AD environment. Each hunt we talk about is structured in three parts. The first part is where we put out the hypothesis. The second part is where we talk through how attacker implements the backdoor or exploits the system. And the third and the most important part is where we talk about how defenders can detect these TTPs in their environment and can hunt for the attacker techniques in their environment. So the first technique we're going to talk about is delegation misuse for persistence. I have two hypotheses for delegation misuse. But before we start talking through how attackers misuse delegation, let's understand what delegation is. Kerberos delegation is a feature of Active Directory and is used extensively in multi-tier application service environments. Consider a simple environment where we have a user who accesses a web server and web server pulls data from a backend database server. When delegation is configured, a web server can mimic and impersonate the user. The web server can use the exact permissions what the user has over the database server to access the database server on user's behalf. There are three forms of delegation. Unconstrained delegation, constrained delegation, and resource-based constrained delegation, or RBCD. In case of unconstrained delegation, when a user connects to the web server, the TGT of the user is placed on the web server. The ticket granting ticket of the user is placed on the web server. If an attacker can exert control over the web server or access the web server with administrative privileges, an attacker can steal that TGT. Once the attacker steals that TGT, the attacker can impersonate the user to access any resource in Active Directory environment. Unconstrained delegation is vulnerable and should not be used. We have seen a lot of organizations move from unconstrained delegation to constrained delegation and resource-based constrained delegation. The hypothesis which we are sharing today are based on constrained delegation and RBCD. The first hypothesis is the threat actor has configured constrained delegation to maintain persistent access to the domain controller. How is constrained delegation different than unconstrained delegation? The constrained delegation in, is configured on the front-end server. In our last example, it was the web server. It is defined on the web server, or in this case, service A, which services can service A access as part of delegation. This is implemented using two features. And I'm talking about a specific case of constrained delegation with protocol transition enabled. The two features are s for you to self and s for you to proxy. s for you to self is used for protocol transition. s for you to self allows a service to receive a forwardable TGS for any user principle without needing delegated credential tokens. Yes, you heard it right. Without having a delegated credential token, service A can use S for you to self to request for a forwardable TGS for any user principle. Once this has been done, S for you to proxy is used to use that forwardable TGS which was received as part of the step one to request another TGS to the target service. That could be the database service in our last example or it could be a domain controller if attacker wants to use this for a covert access. How can an attacker configure this in an environment? In order to configure this, attacker can use PowerShell. The idea here is that attacker would like to maintain a covert persistent access to a domain controller. What the attacker does is the configuration on service A object in the Active Directory environment. So attacker can use PowerShell to configure trusted to auth for delegation as true. This is where attacker is configuring enabling S for you to serve. 
And the next step, which is S for you to proxy, can be configured by setting MSDS allowed to delegate to property. Pointing to service B, the target service which the attacker wants access to, and that could be a domain controller. Once this configuration has been done, the backdoor has been set. After the eradication event, an attacker can come back, and if the attacker can exert control over service A, they can now go through the cycle of S for you to self, S for you to proxy to access service B, which could be a domain controller. What can defenders do to detect this in the environment? As a detection mechanism on domain controllers, organizations should enable computer account management audit events. This policy setting is useful for tracking account related changes to computers that are member of the domain. Event ID 4742 is triggered when changes to a computer object are made. Any change to allow to delegate to property with the critical system SPN as the target should be reviewed. An attacker can set this to the domain controller to maintain that covert access. Threat hunters can perform hunt by using PowerShell to list all the AD objects in the environment and look for that MSDS allowed to delegate to property set to a domain controller or any other critical server. So this is how attackers can use constrained delegation to implement backdoors and use those at a later stage. Not only constrained delegation, RBCD, resource-based constrained delegation, can also be used. So our next hypothesis is that an attacker is using the newer RBCD or resource-based constrained delegation to maintain covert access in the environment and access a domain controller. How is RBCD different than constrained delegation which we saw in our last hypothesis? In case of RBCD, the resource-based constrained delegation, the configuration is now done on service B object. Service B object decides who can access it as part of delegation. The configuration is now being made at service B. The rest of the steps remain the same. So an attacker can come back in, do S for you to self, S for you to proxy and access service B. The DC, the domain controller checks for the requesting server, example web server, should be present in the MSDS allowed to act on behalf of other identity property of service B. So how can an attacker use this for their advantage? So attacker can configure RBCD. To configure RBCD, they can use PowerShell and set principles allowed to delegate to account property. This need to be set on service B and allow service A to access it. And once an attacker comes back, they can go through the cycle of S for you to self, S for you to proxy, and then use that ticket to access the target, which can be a domain controller providing access a covert way to escalate privileges at a later stage to access a domain controller. What can defenders do to detect RBCD? On the domain controller, if audit directory service access policy is enabled, it will provide a low level audit trail of changes that are being made to objects in Active Directory. Let me warn you, the event volume is high for this specific group of logs. Event ID 4662 and 5136 will both track and can be set to alert on changes being made on the DS object. Hunting. Hunters can use PowerShell to list objects which have MSDS allowed to delegate, allowed to act on behalf of other identity property set. So that's what we hunters can do here. And then they can list the objects to see what entries have been made and review those for any malicious activity or malicious entries. That's how RBCD can be used by attackers and that's how defenders can detect those configurations. Let me move on to my second hypothesis. This is about attackers using DS replication permissions. The hypothesis is that the threat actor has assigned DS replication permission to a user they control, a standard user, 
and then they're using that to remain persistent in the environment. This is a technique which we have often seen attackers use. Attackers often assign user accounts they control specific privileged permissions. These are, there are several permissions in Active Directory that can be assigned to a security principle in an AD environment, and then they can act as covered backdoors, and at the same time, provide capabilities for, to an attacker to exert control over the environment. One such permission is DS replication get changes and get changes all. This has been made infamous by the TC sync attack. This permission allows a security principle to remotely retrieve hashes from the domain controller by using the directory replication service remote protocol. So any standard user who has this permission can retrieve anti-hash of any account in your environment from the domain controller by requesting it for that. So how does an attacker configure this? An attacker can again use PowerShell. So in this example, we are using PowerView, which has DC sync command, an aptly named DC sync command to provide these rights to a standard user. Once this has been set, at a later stage when an attacker comes back, if they still have access to that user, they can use a tool like Mimikatz to request for a credential hash from the domain controller. This hash can be of a domain admin, an enterprise admin, or even of the Curb TGT account, the all-powerful Curb TGT account. So this technique is very powerful. But what can defenders do to detect it? When DS replication permissions are added to a user in a domain, if directory service access changes are enabled, a 4662 event is generated. The GUID that is added here refers to the DS replication rights. This should be reviewed when set and, perf and analysis performed. We can also perform a retrospective hunt by using PowerShell. A simple PowerShell command can list all objects in the environment that have DS replication permission assigned, and then they can be reviewed to ensure only accounts that require that right have that right. So that's how defenders can hunt for any DS replication rights that have been assigned to standard users and review those. This takes me to my third hypothesis, which is persistence using machine dollar hash. As I mentioned, this is my favorite technique among the six we are talking about today. When we work with the organizations to perform eradication events, one key part of the puzzle is to perform enterprise-wide password reset. And one piece in this puzzle which is often missed by eradication teams is computer account passwords, which makes this very attractive and apt for threat actors to maintain covert long-term access post-remediation exercises. And this is our next hypothesis for our hunt. Attackers have stolen a machine account password and is using it to access critical servers or even exert control over the domain controller and access it. So what is machine account? Machine accounts are a bit of enigma and are often not completely understood by defenders. Machine account is a security principle that is tied to a computer object. The password hash associated with this account can be used to create service tickets, TGS. Also, silver tickets to access SPNs tied to this machine. So these become very lucrative targets for threat actors. Fortunately for us, these passwords are rotated automatically every 30 days. This password change is requested by the computer object, the machine in question, and is also configured in the registry of that machine, which actually creates a little bit of security weakness. By default, this value is 30 days. Now, what a threat actor can do to implement this covered backdoor is to change the registry setting to increase this 30-day setting to more than 30 days. For in this example, we have taken 365 days. So an attacker gains access to the environment, uses a tool to retrieve the machine dollar hash of an account, of a computer object, and then change the registry setting of that object so that that password doesn't change automatically. 
And when the attacker comes back at a later stage post remediation exercise, the threat actor, the attacker can use that hash to access the server in question. Now that can be a domain controller if the attacker has stolen the machine dollar hash of the domain controller. What can defenders do to detect this? For defenders, we recommend monitoring any changes to the registry which are not authorized. This can be performed by using a EDR or a logging tool like Sysmon. Any changes to registry settings should be reviewed and investigated for. A retrospective sweep of the environment can be performed using PowerShell or any other tool at your disposable at your disposal to look for maximum password each setting. Anything more than 30, which is not default, should be reviewed. So this takes me to the end of the third hypothesis, and I'll hand it over to Thiru to talk through the next three hypotheses. Thanks, Anurag. The next topic that I'm going to discuss is all about group policy objects. Threat actors have compromised domain controllers, and then they have planted backdoors using group policy objects in order to maintain a privileged access over targeted Active Directory server. So this is the hypothesis. Group policy objects are a collection of virtual policy settings that define how a system should look like and how a system should behave for certain users. And GPUs can manage and control users and computers at large scale. GPUs are widely used to not execute scripts, assign rights to user accounts, and in order to harden the security settings of domain-wide systems. We have observed threat actors misusing GPUs to deploy ransomware binaries. After compromising the domain controllers, threat actors have created GPUs and they have linked to certain OU users and they have tweaked certain settings like enabling script execution to make sure that the binaries they're going to push will not be blocked by the execution policies in the system side. And then they will disable the logon script delays to ensure the scripts will execute without any delays after user log on into a system. They'll disable the endpoint security software solutions like antivirus engines. And then they will upload the encrypted binaries, which is ransomware binaries as a log on script. After pushing the GPUs and once a user logs into a system, the ransomware binaries execute as a log on script. We observed this technique when we responded to a Ryuk ransomware in certain regions. We can hunt these backdoors from GPOs by exporting all GPOs using PowerShell command, or if you have a GUI access over group policy management, you can export all the GPOs. And then you can use your own parser codes or publicly available tools in order to parse the GPOs. These are some of the vital artifacts that we always recommend to hunt and analyze. Extract the user rights assignment settings and review the privileged access configured for users in GPO. Threat actors can abuse user rights assignment settings in order to provide or assign over permissive rights to the compromised accounts, like logon local rights over domain controller, or backup rights to backup files and directories from critical servers, etc. Following that, Extract all the script associated with the system startup shutdown process and use a log on log off process. Analyze the script and if you note on that, if any malicious codes are embedded into it, it can be a good indicator. We have also observed maze ransomware group leverage scheduled tasks in order to execute binaries. Review all the scheduled tasks configured in the GPUs and understand the necessity of it. Following that, Restricted groups have a special permission to work with the built-in local groups. If you observe the creation of a restricted group in GPU, and if it is assigned to a built-in local group, you would recommend to work with the internal operation team to understand the requirement of it. Because threat actors can use restricted groups in order to maintain a persistent membership access over built-in local groups. Threat actors enable weaker algorithm in order to read credentials from memory in a plain text format and also in order to extract credential hash in a weaker hash format. These are some of the registry settings. We would recommend you to collect the configuration settings of it and analyze. Last but not least, review the machine account password change settings. By default, all the machine account passwords will get reset for every 30 days once. If you observe that someone tampers the net logon parameters, like disabling the password change, or enhancing the password age limit, this can be a good indicator. These are all some of the vital artifacts we would recommend you to hunt 
and detect backdoors from GPUs or it may end up with detecting misconfigurations committed by your internal operations team. Following that, let's discuss how threat actors abuse cross forest trust. The hypothesis here is threat actor have compromised two forests that has trust with each other and then they planted backdoors using SID history in order to meet a privileged access over trusting forest. A quick overview about cross forest trust. Forest is always considered as a security boundary for the resources and domains created within the forest. When a user wants to access a resource in another forest, they need a forest trust. Cross forest trust is established between the two forest root nodes. It can be one way or a two way transitive trust. If it is a one way trust, it means the user in trusted forest can access a resource in a trusting forest. The other way around will not work. And very importantly, SID filtering is enabled by default in a cross forest trust. When a SID filtering is enabled, it will make the trusting forest domain controller to filter out the SIDs from user access token that are not member of trusted forest. In other words, trusting forest will allow SIDs of trusted forest alone. If a user is a member of a group created in a different forest or a domain, those SIDs can't be carried over and this will be filtered in the trusting forest end. There can be scenarios where an organization wants to move a batch of users from one forest to another forest. In those scenarios, they will tweak SID filtering rules by enabling SID history. That's the attribute they will use. When SID history is enabled, the trusting forest domain controller will allow other domain SIDs along with the trusted forest SIDs. But still, certain forest specific rules will be enabled like SIDs, which is other domain SIDs that has RID values between 500 to 1000 will still be filtered in the trusting forest end. When I refer other domain SIDs is any SIDs other than the trusted forest SID. Most of the privileged group RID values will be between 500 to 1000. Threat actors can use SID history in order to plan backdoors. So after compromising two forests, which is forest A and forest B in our case, which has trust with each other, they will move on to forest B, which is considered as a trusting forest, where they will enable the SID history using NetDOM utilities. And then they will create a new security group and they will add it as a member of a built-in administrators group, which is a privileged group and then they will note, it, note down the SID value of the newly created group. They will move on to forest A and they will log into the domain controller. They will choose a user account which is already compromised and then they will inject the SID of newly created group in forest B into the SID history attribute of the user account created or compromised in forest A. So they can leverage tools like Mimikatz to achieve this technique. After successful injection, now the user account will have its own SID as well as an extra SID which is the newly created group in Forest B. Now the compromised user account can request for service ticket from Forest B in order to manage a domain controller as an administrator. As a first step, this will request and receive inter LM TGT from Forest A domain controller. And then it will forward the interim TGT to Forest B domain controller, which will validate the user access token. And it will observe that there is an SID of a group created in Forest B, and that is also a member of a built-in administrators group. So with this validation, the Forest B domain controller will issue a service ticket to the user account in Forest A. Now the user can access Forest B domain controller as an administrator. The key observation here is threat actor have not chosen the privileged group SID and they have not injected that SID into the user account just because the SID filtering rule will filter out the other domain SIDs that has RID values between 500 to 1000. So that's the reason they have created a new group which will have an RID value more than 1000 and in order to maintain a privilege access they have added that group into a built-in administrators group. So this is a technique that attacker generally use in order to abuse SID history. We can detect this technique by enabling user account auditing in domain controller. The event ID 4738 will trigger for any changes to a user account attribute. When a threat actor inject an SID 
into a SID history attribute. This will also trigger the same event ID 4738. And it will also point out the user account where the injection happened. You can also proactively hunt by interacting with domain controllers using PowerShell by listing out users carrying extra SIDs in the SID history attribute. And then you can negate users having same domain SIDs in the SID history attribute. In this way, you can list out all the users carrying other domain SIDs in the SID history attribute. And then after identifying the users, you can list out all the extra SIDs and understand the privileges those SIDs carry. You need to work with your internal operation team to understand the requirement of it. And if they are not aware of this change, then there's a clear indicator that there are some suspicious activities going on in your environment, which needs a detailed investigation in your environment. We have a bonus hunt here. The same techniques can be leveraged by threat actors and they can maintain a privilege access within the same domain. You can proactively hunt using PowerShell command by listing out all the users carrying same domain SIDs in the SID history attribute. And if you observe if those SIDs includes the privilege group RIDs like 512, which is a domain admin, or a 519, which is an enterprise admin, then that's a clear indicator that someone is abusing the SID history attribute in order to maintain a privileged access within the environment. So SID filtering has no effect within the domain. Let's move on and discuss how threat actors abuse Azure AD Connect Server. The hypothesis here is threat actors have compromised Azure AD Connect Server and with the local admin rights, they have planted malware in order to harvest credentials of all the users signing in through Azure AD. Azure AD Connect is a Microsoft tool that supports hybrid authentication. And this is generally installed in an on-premise environment. And Azure AD Connect acts as a bridge between on-premise Active Directory Server and Azure AD in order to synchronize the user attributes or properties. Azure AD along with Azure AD Connect supports various authentication methods like pass hash synchronization, pass through authentication, and federated authentication with the help of ADFS server. Organizations prefer pass through authentication method in scenarios where they wanted all the cloud users to get authenticated with on-premise Active Directory server. And if they don't want to synchronize the hash of the password hash with Azure AD. This diagram represents the authentication flow of pass through authentication method. I'm going to give a quick overview on the authentication flow. So now a user wants to access an application. And if they have not already signed, the application will redirect to a Azure AD sign-in page. Now the user enters the credentials. Azure AD will collect the credentials, will encrypt it with the public key of Azure AD Connect, which is installed in on-premise. And then the encrypted credentials will be converted into a request, and the Azure AD will add the request into a queue. Azure AD Connect, which is in on-premise, will always have a persistent connection with Azure AD. So after retrieving the request from the queue, it will decrypt the credentials using its own private key. And then it will validate the credentials with on-premise Active Directory Server. Based on the response it receives, it will forward it to Azure AD. And Azure AD will allow the user to access the application when it receives a successful authenticated response and if multi-factor authentication is not enabled. From an even standpoint, you can observe the successful sign-in log of a user account in Azure AD, as well as there will be some related events recorded in on-premise Active Directory Server, like service ticket request for the AAD Connect Server. Threat actors can tamper the authentication flow by compromising the on-premise Azure AD Connect Server. And then with the local admin rights, they will inject a malicious DLL into a process called Azure AD Connect Authentication Agent Service. So this process is responsible for validating the credentials with on-premise Active Directory Server, which is step seven. In order to achieve this attack technique, threat actors can leverage tools like AAD internals, and then they will install AAD internal PTS spy functions, and which will inject a malicious DLL into this process. And then it will start harvest the credentials of all the users signing in through Azure AD. And then it will record all the decrypted version of credentials into a hidden file. Along with that, this will also bypass the credential validation process with on-premise Active Directory Server. And now the on-premise Azure AD Connect Server will send successful authenticated response for user trying with any passwords. In other words, 
user can use a valid or an invalid password, but still the Azure AD Connect server will always send a successful authenticated response to Azure AD. This is a bit scary, right? Step seven and step eight will not happen when a malicious DLL is injected successfully. We can detect this technique using EDR tools or Sysmon utilities. The Sysmon will trigger event ID 7 whenever it observes uh, new images are loaded into a process or if a new DLL is loaded into any process. We can customize the Sysmon configuration by focusing specific to a process called Azure AD Connect Authentication Agent Service. And then you can flag out if any images loaded into it or if any DLLs are injected into it. You can also proactively hunt using PowerShell commands by listing out all the modules installed in the specific process. And then you can analyze and flag out the odd DLLs to do a binary triage. A key consideration here, events for service ticket request for AAD Connect will not be logged in the Active Directory server. What it means, when a user tries to access an application, there will be a successful sign-in log in Azure AD whereas there will not be no related events recorded in Active Directory servers. Like 4768 and 4769 event ID will not be recorded because a malicious DLL will bypass the credential validation process with on-premise Active Directory server. This can also be a good indicator to detect this technique. We are pretty much to the end of this session. We refer to various blogs created by different researchers we really want to thank and acknowledge all their wonderful work. Thanks a lot for listening to our talk. I hope this was an informative session. Kindly reach us for any questions related to the talk. Thank you.